Hi guys, I'm going to get back to People of the Lie, Group Evil, Scott Peck's examination of They Lie, and I spelled it wrong um, in my last video. It is M-Y-L-A-I, and if you don't know about the atrocities committed by the U.S. military in Vietnam, specifically in the province of Mê Lai, then you can put in the YouTube search bar Mê Lai, M-Y, capital L-A-I, and you will see an awful lot of documentaries, a lot of videos on what took place in Mê Lai. So, this is part two of the video that I posted a couple of days ago, which is entitled People of the Lie, Group Evil, it's a just talking video. So, group dynamics, dependency and narcissism. You're going to have to go back to that video if you uh, are confused about where I am picking up. But group dynamics, dependency and narcissism. Individuals not only routinely regress in times of stress, they also regress in group settings. If you do not believe this, watch a Lions Club meeting or a college reunion. One aspect of this regression is the phenomenon of dependency on the leader. It is quite remarkable. Assemble any small group of strangers, say a dozen or so, and almost the first thing that happens is one or two of them rapidly assume the role of group leader. It does not happen by a rational process of conscious election. It just happens naturally, spontaneously and unconsciously. Why does it happen so quickly and easily? One reason, of course, is that some individuals are either more fit to lead than others or else desire to lead more than the rest. But the more basic reason is the converse. Most people would rather be followers. More than anything else, it is probably a matter of laziness. It is simply easy to follow and much easier to be a follower than a leader. There is no need to agonize over complex decisions, plan ahead, exercise initiative, risk unpopularity, or exert much courage. The problem is that the role of follower is the role of child. The individual adult, as individual, is master of his own ship, director of his destiny. But when he assumes the role of follower, he hands over to the leader his power, his authority over himself, and his maturity as decision maker. He becomes psychologically dependent on the leader as a child is dependent on its parents. In this way, there is a profound tendency for the average individual to emotionally regress as soon as he becomes a group member. I read that because throughout my six years, I have received so many comments from people who say, okay, you talk about the problems, but you never talk about solutions. Okay, I have talked about solutions. I don't think a lot of people want to hear about solutions because that requires them to take action. And I want to ask those who drop those comments, what, what's the solution? What's the solution? Why is it that you have to ask somebody else what the solution is? And why aren't you, as an adult, thinking about solutions? Now, the solution is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to take local action in your own communities. Very few do. I... And the fact is, is that now very few even want to follow. Uh, they just, most people don't want to do anything. Most people don't want to change. But we have lived this, certainly my entire life. 
and Scott Peck is talking about Americans, um, but he goes into a rather in-depth analysis of group evil and how it comes about. And when you are following, you're not thinking. You know, you end up just following the leader. And I've said this in a lot of videos that I have posted throughout the years. We Americans, on the whole, I am not talking about everybody, but I am talking about the majority. And the majority follow the leader. The Democrats follow their leader. The Republicans follow their leader. And they do it with a kind of blind obedience. Never questioning their leader because they're kind of stuck at a level of consciousness where the personality trumps truth, trumps principle. And when that individual is stuck at that level of consciousness, they don't care about truth. They only care about cheerleading for their leader, following along, and they will literally follow a leader that is incredibly evil. But we've been voting for the lesser of two evils, certainly my entire life. Um, so, obedience is the number one military discipline. The dependency of the soldier on his leader is not simply encouraged, it is mandated. And by nature of its mission, the military designingly and probably realistically fosters the naturally occurring regressive dependency of individuals within its group. That kind of regression is really important to be aware of within your own self. When you are aware that you are handing over your own power to a leader, when you are aware that you are now putting yourself in a position of being a child to that leader, and when you are aware that what's happening is a regression, you can kind of snap out of it. Snap out of it. And do the work necessary to retain your adult, your adult um, responsibilities, your adult thinking. You retain the ability to think for yourself. Now, an awful lot of groups do end up having leaders, but the adults who are the followers will be able to question the leaders and won't just go along with everything that they're saying. Especially when that going along is in the direction of evil, in the direction of immoral acts. We really do have very few adults here in our country. That's the truth. Most Americans are children. So, I'm sorry about this because it kind of takes in the what took place at Melai, but I'm not going to go back into, you know, what did take place. So he goes back and forth from, you know, just generally speaking about groups to the specific groups within the military, but he does get to the American group, the American people. So, in talking about what took place at Melai, that approximately, I, I think it was about 500 that took place, not directly 
there were about 50 soldiers directly involved in the slaughtering of innocent Vietnamese women, children, elderly in this village. There were no enemy combatants, and they knew it, but they went ahead and killed. They killed about 500 innocent Vietnamese. So Scott Peck was commissioned by the U.S. Army to do an examination of what went wrong. Um, so he writes, in talking about individuals, um, going against what took place and individuals that may have been able to have the courage to report the atrocity. And then he talks about mutiny and mass. If mutiny and mass seems far-fetched, could we not at least have anticipated that a few individuals would have been brave enough to rebel against the leadership? Not necessarily. I have already made note of the fact that patterns of group behavior are remarkably similar to the behavior of the individual. And this is because a group is an organism. It tends to function as a single entity. A group of individuals behave as a unit because of what is called group co cohesiveness. There are profound forces at work within a group to keep its individual members together and in line. When these forces to cohesiveness fail, the group begins to disintegrate and ceases to be a group. So as I'm reading this, think about the liberal progressives. And think about how, especially when Trump won, and we began to see behaviors that were shockingly childish. The crying, the tantrums of the liberal progressives. Oh my God, Hillary didn't win. And, and then the violent absurdity of groups like Antifa. Now how do you get people of all ages to agree to go out in groups and never have a rational discussion with anybody that disagrees with you. Instead, what you do is you shout them down with insults. You call them a racist. You call them a misogynist. You call them all these names. And then you even throw punches at them. See, in a healthy society, that would have been stopped immediately. It would not have continued. But we don't have a healthy society. Probably the most powerful of these group cohesive forces is narcissism. In its simplest and most benign form, this is manifested in group pride. As the members feel proud of their group, so the group feels proud of itself. Once again, the military deliberately does more than most organizations to foster pride within its group. It does so through a variety of means, such as developing group insignias, unit standard flags, such as patches or soldier patches, even special uniform deviations, such as the Green Berets, and encouraging group competition ranging from intramural sports to the comparison of unit body counts. It is no accident that the common term for group pride is a military one. Esprit de corps? I might not be pronouncing that right. A less benign but practically universal form of group narcissism is what might be called enemy creation or hatred of the outgroup. Look at all of the groups. 
in this country that are literally fueled by having an enemy. The liberals have their enemy, the conservatives. The Democrats have their enemy, the Republicans. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this has taken on a, a behavior that is so infantile, it, it's very hard to live in this country at this point because everything has been reduced to utter stupidity and nobody seems to be able to have a rational discussion anymore. Um, and if you say just one thing, like you want immigration laws enforced, that means you're a racist. Okay, how does that make me a racist? It doesn't matter. You're the enemy, and they get to call you names. Is it a wonder that we can't get anywhere in this country? All of this is deliberately engineered, but most people don't understand the deliberate engineering of this, and they fall prey to its manipulation very, very easily. But what really allows people to fall into that kind of behavior is group. The group mentality, the herd-like behavior, they all begin to act the same. And that's why we have madness all over the country. Um, when you are surrounded by your social network and they're all behaving the same, you're all patting yourself on the back, telling each other that you are fine, your enemy is not, and how you treat your enemy is absolutely fine if you're all treating your enemy exactly the same. You're so entrenched in this kind of behavior that you don't see it for what it is, which is grammar school behavior. And if you took a step outside and observed what goes on within your own group objectively for a while, you might begin to see this behavior. Now, a lot of people don't like to do that because they'll also see their own behavior. And that hurts but it is the only way to grow. So, yes, a less benign but practically universal form of group nar narcissism is what might be called enemy creation or hatred of the outgroup. We can see this naturally occurring in children as they first learn to develop groups. The groups become cliques like in seventh grade. Those who do not belong to the group or the clique are despised as being inferior or evil or both. If a group does not already have an enemy, it will most likely create one. In short, order. Task Force Barker, of course, had a pre-designated enemy, the Viet Cong. But the Viet Cong were largely indigenous to the South Vietnamese people from whom they were often impossible to distinguish. So almost inevitably the specified enemy was generalized to include all Vietnamese so that the average American soldier did not just have or did ju not just hate the Viet Cong, he hated gooks. And don't you remember that word? That derogatory name during the 60s. It is almost common knowledge that the best way to cement group cohesiveness is to ferment the group's hatred of an external enemy. Deficiencies within the group can be easily 
and painfully overlooked by focusing attention on the deficiencies or sins of the outgroup. Now, take the individual. If the individual cannot take responsibility for what they do that is clearly wrong, if they can't take responsibility for their part in any kind of conflict or they can't take responsibility for anything that they do wrong, if they can't and there is somebody facing them saying you did this, they will eventually make you the enemy because they have to protect themselves. And the same kind of dynamic happens with groups. So, uh, the Germans under Hitler could ignore their domestic problems by scapegoating the Jews. And when American troops were failing to fight effectively in New Guinea in World War II, the command improved their esprit de corps, de corps. I don't, it's a military term that I've not come across. Um, but this use of narcissism, or I'm sorry, uh, the com command improved the esprit de corps by showing them movies of Japanese committing atrocious acts. But this use of narcissism, whether unconscious or deliberate, is potentially evil. We have extensively examined the ways in which evil individuals will flee self-examination and guilt by blaming and attempting to destroy whatever or whoever highlights their deficiencies. Now we will see the same malignant narcissistic behavior and it comes naturally to groups. From this, it should be obvious that the failing group is the one likely to behave most evilly. Failure wounds our pride, and it is the wounded animal who is vicious. In the healthy organism, failure will be a stimulus to self-examination and criticism. But since the evil individual cannot tolerate self-criticism, it is in time of failure that he or she will inevitably lash out one way or another. And so it is with groups. Groups failure or group failure and the stimulation of group self-criticism act to damage group pride and cohesiveness. Group leaders in all places and ages have therefore routinely bolstered group cohesiveness in times of failure by whipping the group's hatred for foreigners or the enemy. And that's exactly what happens with the American people. You've got the group leader, Obama, and he's the leader of those liberal progressive Democrats, and he's going to whip them up into a frenzy, and he's going to get them to go along with gun control, and he's going to get them to be so immature and non-thinking that whatever he says is right. And no matter how much education a person has, when you look at just the gun control issue, it's not the gun. It has nothing to do with the gun. It has nothing to do with the AR. 15 or whatever, the automatic rifles, it has nothing to do with that because these guns and these rifles don't walk to a school themselves and start shooting kids. Now, if they can't even see that there is a false flag agenda here, um, all right, but you would think that they would be able to think think for themselves. Okay, it's not the gun. There's something else going on here. 
Now, one very obvious thing is psychiatric medications. Most of the school shooters have been on or were getting off medications that induce homicidal ideation and induce violent behavior. But no one's going to be talking about that, right? We're going to skip over that and we're just going to take away the guns. We need more laws. And nobody can see how stupid that kind of thinking is. Really. Okay. Well, when you are living a time where the majority of your fellow citizens are really incredibly stupid, not engaging any kind of critical thinking to the problems that the society faces, well, one, one real bad consequence of that is that we all go down. We all get to face the consequences of what is what is tyranny taking over. And yes, they do want to get rid of those guns. But when you're whipped up in that group frenzy, like a march on Washington, oh, wasn't that today? All of those kids, and you have these adults who cannot see that these kids are being exploited. They cannot see the money behind this march and getting this all orchestrated. Was it children doing this? Or were adults exploiting those children to go down to Washington and march? I'm sorry, but 14 years of life and 15 years of life, 16, 17, 18 years of life, you don't get um, what really is going on. You can't understand the propaganda, but the adults can. And as far as I'm concerned, any adult that believes that laws are going to stop these school shootings, that, that taking away the guns or having more, um, or taking away the, the uh, automatic rifles, that that's going to keep our kids safe, is not someone who can think. It's just not going to happen. And anybody who wants to walk into a school and shoot up children, they will know how to get guns. And it will only create a more profitable black market for guns, for uh, automatic rifles. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm really struggling. You know, you, you hear as a child that you're in, in the number one country and that we have the best system and we've got the best education system and we're the smartest, we're the greatest. And then you grow up and you have to face living life here, every day, people getting more and more stupid. Um, and that's just one example. So, the malignant narcissistic behavior of groups. From this, it should be obvious that the failing group is the one likely to behave most evilly. Failure wounds our pride, and it is the wounded animal who is vicious. In the healthy organism, you, you do that self-examination. 
which so few have the courage to even begin. And that causes an awful lot of problems when you are not doing that self-examination and you can't objectively criticize your own self, you will go on and on, unchanging and creating an awful lot of harm. But since the evil individual cannot tolerate self-criticism in its time of failure, then it's just like groups. They can't either. And they will They will just continue to become more and more vicious, become more and more hate-filled, and just lash out all over. Returning to the specific subject of our examination, we will remember at the time of Melai, the operation of Te Task Force Barker had been a failure. After more than a month in the field, the enemy had still not been engaged. They could not find the Viet Cong. Yet the Americans had slowly and regularly sustained casualties. The enemy body count, however, was zero. Failing in its mission, which was to kill, in the first place, the group leadership was all the more hungry for blood. Given the circumstances, the hunger had become indiscriminate, and the troops would mindlessly satisfy it. So the Specialized Group Task Force Barker. So when he was speaking of the regression that individuals undergo when they take the role of followers in a group, he was talking of specialization in terms of the military. The follower is not a whole person. He whose accepted role it is neither to think nor lead has defaulted his capacity to think and lead. And that's what soldiers do. They become little boys and little girls looking at their superiors as mommy and daddy and they get to live a life being ordered around. And even when the Geneva Convention uh, are, are violated even when it's so clear that they are committing atrocities, even when it's so clear that they are committing war crimes. They don't have the capacity within themselves to stand up as an adult. They don't have the strength. They don't have the courage because they've handed it all over when they have joined that group and made a conscious decision to be a child, to live their life ordered about. And because thinking and leading are no longer his specialty or duty, he usually defaults his conscience in the bargain. From these examples, we can discern three general principles regarding specialized groups. First, the specialized group, and it's not just the military. So when you hear the specialized group term, you can think of any group out there. You've got environmental groups. You've got climate change groups. You've got the liberal progressive groups, you've got homosexual groups, you've got transgender groups, you've got gun control groups, you've got every group under the sun operating here in this country and everybody is fighting their enemy. How glorious life has become. 
First, the specialized group inevitably develops a group character that is self-reinforcing. Second, specialized groups are therefore particularly prone to narcissism, that is, to experiencing themselves as uniquely right and superior in relation to other homogeneous groups. Finally, the society at large, partly through the self-selection process described employs special, specific types of people to perform in specialized roles. As for instance, it employs aggressive, conventional men to perform its police functions. Um, so, I'm jumping ahead because then he just goes into the specifics about what took place at May Lai. And I hope that everybody does get this book and reads it because it is very um, elucidating, educating, and hopefully it will inspire everybody to take a look at themselves and their own behavior. Um, so I just want to jump ahead to where he's talking about scapegoating. A second issue is the subtle but definite scapegoating involved. The pro-typical Larry was a petty cheat and thief, an unpleasant sort of chap for whom it is not easy to feel great sympathy, but he was also a scapegoat. So he's talking about soldiers. How often do we see the military leaders scapegoating soldiers? And how easy it is to scapegoat those who have turned over their conscience, their courage, their strength, and their individuality. Especially in the military, it's very clear to see. The whole point of basic training is to destroy the individual's individuality and get all of those soldiers to be just like each other. Common. Now we see it in Common Core. Destroy the individuality. Because when you destroy the individuality, you do destroy their conscience. You do destroy their strength. You do destroy their courage. You destroy their ability to think for themselves. You destroy their ability to ever stand up and speak out against injustice. They're waiting for the leader to do that. So he talks about all, all of the scapegoating that goes on in the military and you know and and it's usually the lower ranked officers that get scapegoated. And Let's go into more of the generalized society. Um, one way in which scapegoating is highlighted is in the history of the anti-war movement. Criticism of America's role in Vietnam began to flourish in 1965 among the intellectual left. But despite all the teach-ins and mass marches, the anti-war movement never gained any grassroots support and hence effectiveness until 1970. Why this time lag? Certainly a number of factors were involved. But perhaps the most important factor, one that has gone largely unrecognized, was that it was not until 1969 
that any significant numbers of drafted Americans who had not volunteered to go there began to be sent to Vietnam. So it was quite natural that the vast American public should not have been particularly aroused when everyone in Vietnam wanted to be there. Conversely, it is natural that the public began to be upset only when brothers and sons and fathers who did not want any part of it began to be sent to Vietnam. That was when grassroots support of the anti-war movement first started. So, the point is, is that we had a sufficient number of specialized killers to fight a relatively large-scale war for six years without significantly personally involving the American public as a whole. Since they were not personally involved, the public was mostly content to let the killers they had created do their thing. The public did not begin to assume responsibility for the war until we ran out of specialists. And this is the third issue we must look at. It presents us with a dreadful reality we must not ignore. For the reality is that it is not only possible but easy and even natural for a large group to commit evil without emotional involvement simply by turning loose its specialists. It happened in Vietnam. It happened in Nazi Germany. I'm afraid it will happen again. It's happening now in the Middle East. What we need to learn is that whenever we create a specialty group, we are creating the dangerous possibility that our right hand will not know what our left is doing. So then he goes on to argue, um, or uh, he says, I am not arguing that we should do without specialty groups entirely. That would be to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but we must realize the potential danger and structure our specialty groups in such a way as to minimize it. Oh, it's raining now. Um, he also goes on to talk about a draft in voluntary service is the only thing that can keep our military sane. And perhaps he was right. We haven't had a draft since Vietnam. Our military has become utterly, violently, grossly, immorally insane. We humans are so constituted that we need a sense of our own social significance. Nothing can give us more pleasure than the sense that we are wanted and useful. Conversely, nothing is more productive of despair than a sense that we are useless and unwanted. In a time of sustained peace, the military man is disregarded, at best considered by his country as a necessary evil, and more often as a rather pathetic parasite on the body politic in time of war, however, he suddenly becomes needed again. And we are the war nation. Like London is the, is the banking capital of the world, we are the war capital of the world. And that's why we are continuously at war. So, the state of war is therefore not only psychologically satisfying to the career soldier, but economically rewarding as well. So many people who have wanted peace have never wanted 
the military bases closed in their area because so many people, that's their livelihood. So there is a paradox, there's a hypocrisy there. So it is inevitable then that the ordinary career military man unconsciously, if not consciously, desires, longs for war. War is his fulfillment. One of these, one of the things this means is that the United States military was not in Vietnam in 1968 reluctantly. The prevailing attitude of career personnel was not one of doubt or caution or restraint. If anything, it was an exuberant, whoopee, let's go at it, boys. You think of LBJ, you think of Lyndon Johnson, can't you hear him saying, whoopee, let's go at it, boys. It's a sort of fervor. And everyone gets caught up in it who's involved in the military. And it's sanctified by the president, commander-in-chief, who himself went to Vietnam and instructed the troops to bring the coonskin home. Johnson. Another factor to be considered is the technolog technological nature of the American military in the 1960s. The military had not always been so oriented, but this was the time of the acme of our faith in technology in general and American technology in particular. And I read that part because technology was a huge factor in this war. It wasn't fighting communism. It was using new technology in a war to see how it would go. And some of that technology refers to the weather modification that the U.S. military used in Vietnam to prolong monsoons in Vietnam to flood out the uh, Viet Cong and to flood out all of their roadways and paths. Um, so even when we were in Vietnam with this technology, it wasn't working. We were losing. America was the mightiest nation on earth, and we were losing. In its entire history, it had never lost a war. But now the unbelievable was happening. In 1967-68, we were first beginning to perceive intimations of the reality of something so monstrous, monstrous that we had never even conceived of it before we were failing to win the war with all our technology in a tiny little country against an unindustrialized and supposedly primitive people we the mightiest nation on earth were losing we were losing what did that mean did it mean that we should take stock of ourselves? Do that self-examination? No. What it meant was to bring it on more. At the time of Milai in early 1966, or 68, I'm sorry, the military was like an enormous, confident beast, suddenly finding itself beginning to be hurt and wounded by a hundred little darts without even knowing where the blows were coming from. It was beginning to bellow in rage and confusion. It is practically an axiom, um, axiom that cornered or wounded animals are particularly vicious or dangerous. America was neither seriously concerned nor threatened 
in Vietnam in early 1968, but its pride had definitely been struck to the quick. And the pride of the military in particular was badly wounded. Again and again, we have noted the birth of evil from a condition of threatened narcissism. So think about the malignant narcissist. Think about what happens when you shine the light on them. Think about what happens when you point out their projection is actually their own bad character traits. They project them onto the scapegoat. It's, it's them they are talking about. When you shine that light, ever experienced narcissistic rage? It is vicious. And it really knows no bounds. Now think of the group. What did we do in Vietnam when our pride was hurt? We acted like the malignant narcissistic individual with narcissistic rage. We began just dumping bombs, destroying not just Vietnam, but Cambodia. So, um, We are not wise. We're not a good people. We're extremely young, immature. We're about brute force. For the military, the conditions were ripe for evil just as the highly narcissistic evil individual will strike out to destroy whoever challenges his or her self-image of perfection. So by late 1967, the American military organization, highly narcissistic, as all groups tend to be, began to strike out with uncharacteristic viciousness and deceit against the Vietnamese people who were wreaking such havoc on its self-esteem. Suspected spies were tortured. Viet Cong bodies, dead or perhaps still alive, were dragged in the dirt behind armored personnel carriers. The era of the body count, that's one of the stray cats. The era of the body count had begun the lying and falsification Characteristic of our involvement in the Vietnam War was the beginning escalated. I'm sorry. The lying and falsification characteristic of our involvement in the Vietnam War from the beginning escalated. Yes. Wrong inflection. Although the atrocity at May Lai was undoubtedly unique in magnitude, I have every reason to suspect that smaller atrocities were being committed by American troops throughout Vietnam at the time. That's probably quite true. I think we can safely say that May Lai occurred in the context of an atmosphere of atrociousness and evil that was pervasive, not only in Task Force Barker, but throughout the entirety of the American presence in Vietnam. As I have said, and this is what Scott Peck is saying, as I have said, I was among several people who were asked to propose research that would contribute to the understanding of the psychological aspects of the May Lai, of May Lai, knowing full well that it would receive an unfavorable reception. Our committee was nevertheless compelled by honesty to make the proposal, among others, that the incidents of atrocities committed by American troops elsewhere in Vietnam should be examined and compared, if possible, with the incidents of atrocities committed by American troops in other wars against other enemies. Between the Philippine insurrection in 1899 and May Lai, 
there is nothing publicly written or documented about war crimes and atrocities committed by Americans. Are we to assume that American boys simply did not commit such brutalities in Korea or during World War II? No, they were the great generation. And let's spit on the Vietnam veterans who came back from that war. Right. Good moral people, Americans. And we treated our Vietnam veterans as if they were scum. When in fact we were all scum. Harsh word, isn't it? Atrocities were committed by World War II soldiers. Atrocities were committed when this country was founded. When the white man got here. Atrocities is what we are good at. They didn't just start with the Vietnam veteran. Our hypocrisy is sickening. So, we can never fully understand the group evil of Mei Lai without answers to such questions. Answers could be provided only through scientific historical research on the subject, although there are technical difficulties and immunity from prosecution would have to be granted though to those questioned. Whether it is polit politically feasible is another matter. matter. It was not expedient in 1972 when we proposed proposed it. My prediction is that these questions will go unanswered not because the answers are unworthy of the trouble involved but because we as a people would simply rather not work towards discovering the answers. The potential for embarrassment is too great. We would rather not examine ourselves and our society so closely in this regard. Our potential for evil as a group is still sufficient for us to avoid looking squarely at it. The purpose of our being asked in 1972 to make recommendations for research on the psychological aspects of Mei Lai was to make progress toward the goal of preventing such atrocities in the future. Our proposed research was rejected in full. So the military didn't really want to know what was behind the atrocities. The American people certainly didn't want to know. The soldiers who committed the atrocities didn't want to know. You think the Vietnamese wanted to know? So without examination, and it doesn't matter whether it's the individual or the group, when we don't examine our own behavior, Unfortunately, it gets worse and worse. The individual who never examines their own behavior and corrects that behavior when that behavior is wrong or immoral or harming somebody else, they'll continue. They will absolutely continue to engage in that kind of behavior. And if it does not correct, if they can't correct their behavior, that individual may very well put themselves on a road of evil. 
and may very well become an evil human being. And the longer you stay on that road, the harder it is to turn around and get on the right road. It takes an awful lot of work. You know, we've got a lot of Christians out there believing that they are good and they're on the right road, but they have never done that kind of examination to find out if it's so. It's easier to stay on the same road as long as what you're doing isn't hurting you. So the largest group, American society in 1968. While the military may have been crashing around in Vietnam like a crazed bull, it did not get there of its own accord. The mindless beast was sent there and let loose by the United States government acting on behalf of the American people. Why? Why did we wage that war? Basically, we fought the war because of a com combination of three attitudes. Communism was a monolithic evil force hostile to human freedom in general and American freedom in particular. It was America's duty as the world's most economically powerful nation to lead the opposition against communism. And communism should be opposed wherever it arose, by whatever means necessary. This combination of attitudes comprising the American posture in international relations had its origins in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And it goes on to talk about World War II and the Soviet Union and the extraordinary speed and aggressiveness of communist USSR and how it was taking over Eastern European countries, China falling under communist domination domination in the 1950s. So it was a real threat. The problem, however, is that by a scant dozen years later, kind of after World War II, there was a wealth of evidence to indicate that communism was not a force that was either monolithic or necessarily evil and certainly not to ourselves. And when I am reading a book or putting up a video of somebody else's, I don't agree with everything that person says. And I do believe that Communism is an evil. And we're getting a taste of it now. How do you like it? So, but he, he does talk about China and the USSR. Uh, no longer allies, but potential enemies. Which... Sorry. Um, no longer enemies, so that made, you know, the threat a little bit more. But our military involvement in Vietnam began in the period between 1954 and 1956, when the idea of a monolithic communism or a communist menace seemed realistic. A dozen years later, it was no longer realistic. Yet, at precisely the time when it had ceased to be realistic, when we should have been readjusting our strategy and withdrawing from Vietnam, we began to seriously escalate our military involvement there in defense of obsolescent attitudes. Why? Why, beginning 
around 1964 did America's behavior in Vietnam become increasingly unrealistic and inappropriate? There are two reasons. Laziness and once again, narcissism. Attitudes have a kind of inertia. Once set in motion, they will keep going, even in the face of the evidence. To change an attitude requires a considerable amount of work and suffering. The process must begin either in an effortfully maintained posture of constant self-doubt and criticism, or else in a painful acknowledgement that what we thought was right was not. That proceeds into a state of confusion. We no longer seem to know what is right or wrong or which way to go. But it is a state of openness and therefore of learning and growing. It is only from the quicksand of confusion that we are able to leap to the new and better vision. We may properly regard the men who governed America at the time of Malai, the Johnson administration, as lazy and self-satisfied. They, like most more ordinary individuals, had little taste for intellectual confusion. They had developed, or they assumed that the attitudes they had developed toward the monolithic communist menace during the preceding two decades were still the right attitudes. Now this is where I disagree because yeah laziness on the part of the American people more but the Johnson administration and Johnson himself they knew that it wasn't that communism was not a threat. that we were losing the war. That was enough to keep those attitudes going. And yes, you know, Americans are all about competition and winning, 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 winning. Whoever has the most toys when they lose, when they die, wins. Um, there was far more going on behind the scenes than Scott Peck was aware of. And I do say was aware of, and not that he was hiding something. I, I don't think that he really fully understood his own government. And when you dive into an examination of evil, you do have to face your own evil acts. And, and a lot of people have trouble with the word evil. I don't anymore. And I'm not using it in a religious context, but it's very clear, you know, um, you've got good and you've got evil. So I'm just keeping it simple. And yeah, I mean, lying, um, a lot of people, you know, have a tendency to dismiss much of what they do because ugh, it's just a little thing, you know, but it's still an evil act, you know, so you may not be out there uh, as a serial killer killing people, you might not be out there raping people, you might not be out there um, stealing huge amounts of money. And we have a tendency to justify our wrongdoing as okay, especially when we compare it to other people, but it's still not okay. It doesn't make it okay. It still needs to be worked on and corrected.
So I think if Scott Peck lived longer, I think he might have written another book. And I think he would have come to an awareness of how incredibly evil is our government and military. So he's talking about the Johnson administration and, and I'm not saying that you should discount or think that Scott Peck is wrong because there are so many different factors that go on within an individual and go on within a group all of which contribute to the end result which can be atrocities um, so he's talking about the Johnson administration believing that they had the right attitudes even in the face of great evidence, mounting evidence, that they were wrong. So he says that those men could not put themselves in the painful and difficult position of having to rethink their attitudes. They had agendas. There is nothing to rethink for them. They were evil. And when you have evil, as opposed to someone who's not evil, but committing, you know, wrongs and sins and how, whatever you want to call it, the evil person, no, they have agendas. And unfortunately, These are not people who are going to be rethinking their attitudes. So thus far, we have been focusing on the laziness involved in clinging to old maps and attitudes that have become obsolete. Let us also examine the narcissism. We are our attitudes. If someone criticizes an attitude of mine, I feel he or she is criticizing me. If one of my opinions is proved wrong, then I have been wrong. My self-image of perfection has been shattered. Individuals and nations <clears throat> cling to obsolete and outworn ideas, not simply because it requires work to change them, but also because in their narcissism, they cannot imagine that their ideas and views could be wrong. They believe themselves to be right. And you see that operating in Americans across the board. The liberal progressives. I grew up in New York, went to school in Massachusetts, lived in Massachusetts, and I agree with what um, Naomi Wolf said when she was talking about the Second Amendment, when she was talking at that conservative uh, conservative group that invited her to New Hampshire to speak, and she was talking about Naomi Wolf, if you don't know her, do the research to find out who she is, but a journalist, author, um, a real liberal progressive feminist who grew up in New York. And after 9-11, she experienced a turning point when she was talking to a Holocaust survivor. And this Holocaust survivor kept saying the same thing's happening here, the same thing's happening here, and gave her books to read. So that was a real turning point for her. And she wrote... The End of America? Am I getting my books mixed up? It was The End of America. And if you want to listen to um, 
a very interesting presentation, then put it in the search bar on YouTube, Naomi Wolf, The End of America. And she goes through the 10 steps that dictators take to transform their society from a free society to a authoritarian, totalitarian, tyrannical society. And Naomi Wolf, she really very clearly said and succinct in her in her saying was that you travel in the same social network your entire life and you don't you don't realize that you're influenced by all of those around you and you're carrying these beliefs thinking that you, they're yours you have beliefs you think that they're yours but really what they are are the beliefs of those that you were influenced by as a child and then you get into these social networks and you stay oh the people change the names change but the ideas and the beliefs and the values stay the same so Naomi Wolf talked about how when you're a New Yorker and you're a liberal progressive you are traveling in a group that is telling you guns are wrong. You know, New Yorkers don't really have guns. We're not a big gun population. But you're traveling in this group and you don't really have any, you haven't really um, participated outside of your group. You just think you're right. It's the group narcissism that you are, that you are inflicted with but you don't understand it as that you just think that you're right so my social progressive network of people in New York and Massachusetts believed we were right no one should have any guns now I didn't go that far and my position was alright you take away guns get rid of them all 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 you take away the guns from the military and the police and, and all of uh, these um, weapons and have people fight it out. Okay. But if you're not going to do that, I did see, though I didn't really even think about it all that much because it wasn't necessary in my social network, that taking away the guns from the people and allowing the police to have guns I knew it was off there was something wrong with it but I didn't have to flush it out it was only until 2012 well earlier than that just my being on YouTube and my beginning to listen to other people you know and their ideas about guns but it was really only until 2012 when I left Great Barrington and had been driving around the country and staying with people who were very outside my social network and learning and hearing about their life and how they grew up with guns. It was nothing. It was just second nature to them. And that's not how we live in New York. But this idea that we're right that we are right, our way of living is right, your way of living is wrong. It's that group narcissism that allows you to create an enemy. Oh, you have guns? You're wrong. And Naomi Wolf was talking about her, you know, process of beginning to rethink the gun issue and how difficult it was for her to speak publicly about it because she knew that she was going to get destroyed by her social network and destroyed even financially that because Naomi Wolf is a public figure that she was going to get an awful lot of mm, editorials written about her stance on guns and sure enough she did that's how childish we are and unfortunately most Americans are bullies.
No, you're not going to listen to somebody who has now developed a different or questions or you know a different opinion. No, you're going to ruin them. We are extremely narcissistic and childish and never has there been a time before this one where we so need to grow up fast really fast so um, yes If one of my opinions is proved wrong, then I have been wrong. My self-image of perfection has been shattered. Individuals and nations cling to obsolete and outworn ideas, not simply because it requires work to change them, but also because in their narcissism, they cannot imagine that their ideas and views could be wrong. They believe themselves to be right. Oh, we are quick to superficially disclaim our infallibility. But deep inside, most of us, particularly when we have apparently been successful and powerful, we consider ourselves invariably in the right. It was this kind of narcissism manifested in our behavior in Vietnam that Senator William Fulbright referred to as the arrogance of power. Yes, success breeds narcissism so when you think about all of the successful academics out there who in large part are liberal progressives you try to talk to one of them forget it you can't you can be on the same par with them and I had many experiences like this trying to talk to professors or retired professors and I'm an attorney. It was really stunning to watch their behavior. They were right, I was wrong, that was it. I don't even remember one who had an open mind to even consider what I was saying and to question their beliefs. Very immature. So, ordinarily, if our noses are rubbed in the evidence, we can tolerate the painful narcissistic injury involved, admit our need for change, and correct our outlook but as in the case with certain individuals, the narcissism of whole nations may at times exceed the normal bounds. The nation, instead of readjusting in light of the evidence, sets about attempting to destroy the evidence. The situation in Vietnam presented us with evidence of the fallibility of our worldview and the limits of our potency. So rather than rethinking it, we set about to destroy the situation in Vietnam and all of Vietnam with it, if necessary, which was evil. Evil has already been defined most simply as the use of political power to destroy others for the purpose of defending or preserving the integrity of one's sick self. Since it had become outmode, outmoded, our monolithic view of communism was part of our national sick self, no longer adaptive and realistic. And look at us today. It's the Russians who did it. It's the Russians who did it. 2018. It's frightening. No growth. Stagnant. So he's talking about the policies and 
rather than alter these policies, we launched a full-scale war to preserve them intact, rather than admit what would have been a minor failure in 1964, we set about rapidly escalating the war to prove ourselves right at the expense of the Vietnamese people and their self-aspirations. The issue? Preserving our national honor. And to do that? Destroying a country and killing innocent people was an absolute fine choice and a choice we made. And many of us knew it then. I was a little young, but I heard enough going on to know that something was very wrong. President Johnson and the men of his administration knew that what they were doing was evil. Otherwise, why all the lying? Why do people lie? Well, they lie because they have an agenda. They lie because they want to achieve uh, their objectives. Or they lie because they're embarrassed and they don't want to. They want to preserve, you know, their integrity. And yet, <laughs> by lying, you destroy it. They lie because they're afraid they're going to be called out or punished or but they lie because they've known that they're doing something wrong. Bottom line, you don't lie when you don't think that you're doing anything wrong or there's no purpose to it. So here he talks about um, it was so bizarre and seemingly out of character that it is difficult for us merely to recall the extraordinary national dishonesty of those days. A scant 15 years ago, well 15 years from the um, this book hitting the market which was in 1983. Even the excuse President Johnson gave in order to begin bombing North Vietnam was apparently, apparently, no, it was a deliberate fraud, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. It was a false flag. It was an utter lie to sell the war to the American people. How often has that occurred? And we still just sit back and let our government do these false flag attacks? Or let our government lie to us repeatedly? Really? That's who we are. It reflects who we are. So, through this fraud, he obtained from Congress the authority to wage the war without, con without Congress ever formally declaring it as a war which was Congress's constitutional responsibility, and yet they failed. But the American people also failed to hold Congress accountable for their fail failure. Congress failed to hold the president accountable. This is what we're... This is what life is here in America. It's like pure failure all over the place. So then he said about borrowing the money to pay for the war, diverting funds, earmark, or other programs, and extorting saving bonds from the salaries of federal employees so that the American public would not have to immediately pay increased taxes or feel the burden of the escalation. This, this, this is our practice. This is how we live. Nothing has changed. This book is entitled People of the Lie, 
because lying is both a cause and a manifestation of evil. It is partly by their lying that we recognize the evil. President Johnson clearly did not want the American people to fully know and understand what he was doing in Vietnam in their name. He knew that what he was doing would be ultimately unacceptable to them. His defrauding the electorate was not only evil in itself, but was also evidence of his awareness of the evil of his actions, since he felt compelled to cover them up. But it would be a mistake and a potentially evil rationalization itself for us to blame the evil of those days entirely on the Johnson administration. And this is the part that an awful lot of people throughout my six years don't get and don't want to accept and sometimes get really pissed off and attack me. When I say we've all contributed to this nightmare, we're all responsible for it. We must ask why Johnson was so successful, successful in defrauding us. Why did we allow ourselves to be defrauded for so long? Not everyone was. A very small minority was quick to recognize that the wool was being pulled over our eyes, that something rather dark and bloody was being perpetrated by the nation, but why were most of us not aroused to error or suspicion or even significant concern about the nature of the war? And why have we not learned after all these years we still sit back, accept the lies, and we don't change a thing. Neither does our government change a thing. It's a diseased nation that we live in. It has been from the start. Once again, we are confronted with our all too human laziness and narcissism. Basically, it was just too much trouble. We all had our lives to lead, doing our day-to-day -day jobs, buying new cars, painting our houses, sending our kids to college. Sound familiar? As the majority of members of any group are content to let the leadership be exercised by the few, so as a citizenry, citizenry we were content to let the government do its thing. It was Johnson's job to lead, ours to follow. Hey, Trump's going to fix it. God's going to come down and fix it. Jesus is going to return. Besides, we shared with Johnson his enormous, large as Texas narcissism, surely. Our national attitudes and policies couldn't be wrong. Surely our government had to know what it was doing. After all, we'd elected them, hadn't we? And surely they had to be good and honest men. After all, they were byproducts or products of our wonderful democratic system, our Christian nation, which certainly couldn't go seriously awry. And surely whatever type of regime our rulers and experts and government specialists thought was right for Vietnam must be right. For weren't we the greatest of nations and the leader of the free world? Doesn't it? Doesn't it make you sick? We're still the same people without any growth. By allowing ourselves to be easily and blatantly defrauded, 
We as a whole, people, participated in the evil of the Johnson administration. The evil, the years of lying and manipulation of the Johnson administration was directly conducive to the whole atmosphere of lying and manipulation and evil that pervaded our presence in Vietnam during those years. It was in this atmosphere that May Lai occurred in March 1968. Task Force Barker was hardly even aware that it had run amok that day. But then America was not significantly aware either in early 1968 that it had two almost unredeemably lost its bearings. Almost? No. We lost our bearings when we started this country on a lie. That this country was God-given. And that in Christ's name, we had the absolute right to kill off a people, to rape, pillage, cause so much suffering. We had the right to steal the native children and stick them in Christian schools and abuse them, all in Christ's name. And when you don't ever resolve the lies, when you can't do that self-examination and do what is necessary to resolve your past, to resolve the evil that has been committed, it will only get worse and eventually turn on you. If you don't resolve it, you get more sick and diseased. If you don't resolve it, you get more vicious and violent. If you don't resolve it, you can end up living in complete and utter chaos. Are we not there? Yes, we're there. Evil has to do with killing. Not in the corporal sense, but it can kill literally or it can go after your spirit, your soul, your individuality. But evil, think about it, it's live spelled backwards. Evil, live. Oh, evil is about destruction. It is not about enhancing life. It's about destroying life. And war is a form of large-scale killing that we humans consider as acceptable. And it's gotten more acceptable here in this country. And it is completely acceptable to lie, to accept the lies that we hear, we're great, we're humanitarian, even when it's so obvious that we are so disgustingly immoral that we can have our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, laugh as she's talking about how we killed Gaddafi and what we have done, not just in Libya, what we're continuing to do. Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, all of it. Can we really call ourselves good still? Really? Americans are still going to be believing all of this horseshit that we're in these countries because, uh, well, we were attacked on 9-11 and Afghanistan had nothing to do with it. Iraq had nothing to do with it. Yemen certainly had nothing to do with it. Syria had nothing to do with Libya, had nothing to do with it. Oh, okay, but we're just going to go ahead. Oh, that's right. It was those terrorist organizations that we actually created and we fund and we, but Americans love to live in Disneyland. It's fabulous to live. 
a delusion. It only makes you sick, twisted, not, doesn't matter how much, how much success, how much money you have, doesn't matter the home you live in, the car you drive, the clothes you wear, who you associate with. If you accept this, you are completely and utterly twisted because this is, this is evil. No, we're not in these countries to save them from their dictators. You know, it really is frightening to see adults believing this. I look at them and then I when I hear this kind of stuff, I immediately think, oh, wow, there's still seven. They look older, but they're still really seven years old. So he talks about going into killing and that it is intrinsically immoral and how, how is it that we accept this and um, and the free will. Free will is the ultimate human reality and since ours is the power to choose, we are free to choose wisely or stupidly to choose well or badly, to choose for evil or good. And we, on the whole, choose for evil, not good, hell. We've been voting for the evil, but for the lesser of two evils. And we have just justified every evil that we have committed, no matter how large and great the evil is that we commit. It is no wonder that we so often abuse it, that will, and that human behavior in comparison to that of the lower animals so often seems to get out of whack. Many animals may kill to protect their territory, but only a human could direct mass killing of his own species so as to protect his interests in a far distant land he has never set eyes upon. So our human killing is a matter of choice. The ethics of our choice is to kill or not to kill may be there is clearly one factor that contributes to unnecessary and obviously immoral killing Narcissism. Once again, narcissism. One manifestation of our nar narcissism is that we are far more likely to kill that which is different from us than that which resembles us. And now we're killing us. And we don't even care. Wow. Check it out. It's the road we got on from the start, and we never, never turned back. We never even looked. We just got more evil. Wittingly or unwittingly, we actually teach our children this national narcissism. So, he then goes on to talk about um, that both sides have a tendency to call themselves victims. You know, we, we go into Iraq, destroy that country, kill over two million people. And even at the time, we knew Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Oh, but they had weapons of mass destruction. 
and they might use them. They had nothing to do with 9-11. And by the way, the, those weapons of mass destruction, we actually sold them to Iraq, but well, who cares. Um, but it, they had nothing to do with 9-11. So immediately, very soon after 9-11, suddenly the American people are being sold on, we're going into Iraq because we've got to go into some country, right? Because of 9-11. But when did we ever talk about Iraq, Saddam Hussein's connection with 9-11? Oh, it was the weapon, weapons of mass destruction. So we didn't even really think about that either. I was completely against the war, but in even trying to talk to a lot of my liberal progressive friends, none of them were so much for the war, but hardly any of them really cared at all. People were believing in Colin Powell. Yes, he was he was in the hearts of even liberal progressives. We're so easily scammed. And that we could still be a trusting people. <laughs> it's <laughs> all right. Something is amiss there. Anyway, he talks about how we could never see ourselves as villains, right? No, because we're the good people. We're the good guy. All those other people are evil. We good. How could we, we Americans, be villains? The Germans and the Japanese in 1941, certainly they were the villains. The Russians, ah, the Russians still are the villains, right? But Americans? Surely we are not a villainous people. If we were villains, we must have been unwitting ones. We were largely unwitting during those years in Vietnam, but how does it come about that a person or a group or an entire nation is an unwitting villain? The term unwitting villain is particularly appropriate because our vil villainly, villainly, villainy lay in our unwitting Ness. We become villains precisely because we did not have our wits about us. The word wit in this regard refers to knowledge. We were villains out of ignorance. And he goes on to say he used to ask the troops on their way to Vietnam if they knew why they were going. None of them knew. 90% of the junior officers knew nothing. Senior officers and few junior officers, officers did know something generally about why we were in Vietnam. At least 95% of the men going off to risk their very lives did not even have the slightest knowledge of what the war was about. And even those in the Department of Defense, civilians who directed the war. Scott Peck discovered that they had an atrocious ignorance of Vietnamese history. So as a nation, we did not even know why we were waging war. How could this have been? How could a whole people have gone to war not knowing why? The answer is simple. As a people, we were too lazy to learn and too arrogant to think we needed to learn. Whatever way we happened to perceive things was the right way without any further study. And that whatever we did was the right thing to do without reflection. We were so wrong. 
because we never seriously considered that we might not be right. With our laziness and narcissism feeding each other, we marched off to impose our will on the Vietnamese people by bloodshed with practically no idea of what was involved. Only when we, the mightiest nation on earth, consistently suffered defeat at the hands of the Vietnamese did we, in significant numbers, begin to take the trouble to learn what we had done. So, it is that our Christian nation became a nation of villains. We shall not be immune to war until such time as we have made much further progress toward eradicating from our human nature individually and therefore collectively to eradicate laziness and narcissism. But when you have a people who refuse to ever, ever look at themselves, face their own truth, do the work necessary to eradicate that laziness and narcissism, you have a nation that will only continue to commit more and more evil while the ordinary people tell themselves that it must be right. It's good because we're good. And those ordinary people continue to deflect their own responsibility. I think it's a really good book. Check it out. You'll learn a lot.